Hey everybody, it's JB, and welcome back to my channel, or if you've never been here before, welcome for the first time. My light is too bright, so I'm going to figure that out. Ah, yes, that is much better. Uh, Alright, so yeah, my name is JB, welcome to my channel. If you've been here before, you know that we cover a range of topics, from trans things, to Warhammer, to books and indie authors, and grimdark genre type things. And soon, hopefully, paranormal stuff. I know it's kind of an eclectic channel. The algorithm must love me. Um, but yeah, so if you've never been here before, that's kind of what we do here, is we just sort of talk about random things that I feel like talking about each week. I try to upload a video every week when I am recovering from surgery, obviously. That's not really a thing that I do. Um, and I tend to take November off, so today is a little bit special because it is November 19th. Um, the lunar eclipse is at the, like, final stages here, and I am recording a video for the first time this month, uh, that is not on my phone. And the reason why I'm doing this is because today is an auspicious day. And what do I mean by that? Well, for those of you who've been following my channel for a while, I came out as transgender in 2017 on, uh, like, June 8th, sort of around there. And, yeah, it actually went pretty well with my fan base. I was super pleasantly surprised by how many of you were like, Go JV! Like, you got this! And uh, a little bit appalled at the like response that I got from a lot of my relatives, but um, I didn't actually end up starting testosterone until 2019. Specifically, November 19th, 2019. And, yeah, so my initial plan was actually to do something very different that I thought was going to be really cool to do, and I knew it was going to be super hard to do, and I had a feeling I was not going to stick with it, and guess what? I didn't stick with it. So, when I started testosterone, there were a few events that led up to that, because my initial plan was to continue working my job in the A industry, and then retire at 30, and then start my medical transition. And boy, I, there was no way I was going to stick with that, like, looking back now. But when I started testosterone, it was initially because I had been on an estrogen blocker for six months, and it had changed my life. It had brought my chronic pain down significantly. It had made it so I was a more functional person. I was able to eat stuff and, like, actually digest my food. Like... There was a lot of stuff. I, I lost most of my acne. Like, There's so much stuff that uh, changed for me that I refused to go back. So my decision was either continue working in the adult industry and suffering and potentially putting myself in dangerous situations like what had happened to initially start me on the estrogen blocker. And if you're not sure what happened there, um, I'll link you to a video here. I'm actually going to show you snippets of it in this video today, so stay tuned. Um, but I also, uh, right, but the other, the other option was, you know what, say F it to my career, I can continue trying to work in the industry as a trans man, and in the meantime, start testosterone, start my medical transition, make as much headway as possible toward getting to a point where I was no longer in a body that made me want to be not alive anymore. And it was a huge, hard thing for me to do, that's what she said, um, because I had just gotten divorced, I had lost all my money, he took all my money, almost all my money, um, and I was having really bad anxiety about leaving the house, I didn't really have any friends because I'd been isolated by my um, ex-husband pretty significantly, and you know, like, I, I was like, man, I'm gonna start this transition thing, and it is, it is not gonna go well. And I'm gonna lose my job, and I'm gonna be broke, and then I'm gonna be homeless, I'm gonna, you know, lose my cat, and my rabbit, and my uh, salamander, and all these things. But I went ahead and did it anyway, because that's what we do. And, yeah, it turned out to be one of the best decisions of my life. Like, career-wise, absolutely awful, totally tanked my career. Um, I, I don't earn nearly what I used to, not even like a fifth of what I used to make, which is a huge bummer. Um, when I was working on MV regularly, I actually was making between five and eight grand a month off of that alone, not counting my trips to the ranch. 
which were also clocking in uh, between five and 10 grand a month. Yeah, no, and all of that that I had saved up for my top surgery, for college, for potential bottom surgery things, all of that went to my ex-husband. So yeah, it that was not the wisest decision in terms of career and like longevity for me as a person, like monetarily. But in terms of longevity for me as a person, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically, god damn, that was the best decision I ever made was to start testosterone. My plan was to keep it a secret and catalog my transition until I could no longer hide the changes and then release a bunch of videos. I was anticipating it would take about three to five years before people really started to notice and like have questions. I figured I could go ahead and get top surgery under the table, not like actually under the table, but like under the radar without anybody noticing because I was already small chested anyway. And just, there we go, you know, nobody would notice. And yeah, no, that, that, did, that did not work out very well because within two weeks of me starting testosterone, my voice started to drop, I got really throaty, really scratchy. Um, my jaw started to have changes. Fun fact, too, I started testosterone apparently right toward the end of when my growth plates were done, like, doing their thing. So I actually gained a whole inch and, like, a quarter of a shoe size. Really weird, like, not a change that I was expecting. Um, and so, yeah, like, within a month I was like, there's no way I can keep this a secret. So I started sharing it with y'all. So I initially started this series as like, you know, uh, what was it, the the, tra the uh, transgender time, time capsule and um, like keeping, you know, like a, hit, like a history catalog sort of of my transition. And yeah, no, it, it obviously I've, I've been out about myself transitioning almost from the first day that I did my testosterone shot. And I don't regret it. I, I don't. Um, so, the first day that I did my testosterone shot was, well, let's, let's talk through the story here. So I got my doctor's appointment to get on T on October 31st. I had two weeks of therapy that I had to go through and a signed document from a therapist saying, yep, you should be on testosterone. Then I brought that to the same doctor and he was like, cool, you're on T but then there was a testosterone shortage. I really lucked out because the shortage resolved within a day or two of me trying to like take my prescription like out of the pharmacy and then being like, we literally have none for you. Um, and then from that point on, I was injecting testosterone and that, that first shot was November 19th, 2019. And now I'm at the two year mark. I have a, a video that I made, which are like questions for the future and that's meant to be answered at the five-year mark, so I, I do intend on doing that. Um, but there's also a really cool milestone that we're celebrating right now, too, which is the fact that I got top surgery. Like, actual top surgery. I paid for it out of my pocket. So, let's, let's, sorry, I'll keep in line with the, like, timeline here. So, Started testosterone, pandemic hit Vegas pretty hard, everything shut down in March. I moved out of the condo I was in, moved into the house that I'm in now with my partners and my kid. We all kind of hunkered down. I took on a couple of civilian jobs, it, nothing really stuck. One of them I got in trouble for refusing to wear a woman's uniform. The other one, I got told to be put on temporary uh, medical leave because of a chronic condition that I have, and they're like, let us know when it resolves, and I was like, that's never gonna fucking happen, because it's chronic. Um, so yeah, it, you know, civilian job did not really end up very working out very well, but I did my best, and uh, you know, I did as much as I could to just sort of not spend anything, save up as much as I could, um, I'm lucky in that I had enough saved up and uh, enough coming in from my clip store, etc., that I was able to cover all of my bills, pay off a few debts, do some college for the first probably six months before, even like maybe eight months before I was like, this is too expensive for me. Um, and then uh, I was supposed to have my top surgery last year in 2020 in October 
with Dr. Miles Berry in the UK. Unfortunately, um, due to travel restrictions as well as a few other financial things, that was just not going to be feasible for me. Um, so ended up postponing that, but I got lucky because right at that same time, I had a doctor's appointment with a gynecologist um, to sort of figure out how to stop the increasing abdominal pains that I was getting around my cycle and sort of how to, you know, resolve that. And basically, I told her flat out, I was like, look, I've been trying since I was 14 to get this thing out. I want it gone. I'm never going to use it. It hurts. Like, I'm pretty sure it's defective just based on the amount of miscarriages I've had. I've done abortions. I'm a sex worker. Both of my partners are neutered. Like, can we, can we just not have this anymore? And she was like, you don't need to tell me any of that stuff. And I was like, really? And she was like, a person should not have to fight for something that is like their body and that will greatly increase their quality of life. Like from what you've told me about your pain from this, that alone is enough for us to at least go in there and do exploratory surgery and see what's going on in there, if not just remove the whole shebang. And I was like, cool, take all of it out. I don't want it. And we got the surgery scheduled, got everything figured out. It was deemed medically necessary to remove my uterus, both of my ovaries, uh, my cervix, and a ton of scar tissue attached to all kinds of different organs, like holding down, like encasing my bladder. Uh, I had ovaries glued to the bottom of my retroverted uterus. I had my colon glued to my uterus. Um, there were some scar tissue bands that had reached all the way out to like my kidneys and a few other places. Additionally, there was so much scar tissue, they literally could not find my appendix. And so, my recovery from that surgery, the initial surgery, was not harsh at all because I woke up feeling the absence of like a significant amount of pain that I had not realized I had just grown accustomed to having, which was really cool. So, that was great. The downside was I maybe didn't take it as easy as I should have. I ended up having a hemorrhage and uh, having to go in for emergency surgery um, and that was a whole debacle. I'll link you to a video about that somewhere around here or in the you know description because um, I, I go into a lot of depth talking about the treatment that I received at the hospital as well as like what was going on with my body um, that just I, I was not taken very well care of um, but it was also dead in the middle of a COVID spike. There was no room for people in the hospital so yeah it was it was terrible so yeah that that kind of was that was that year really it was a lot of just waiting and then all of a sudden yeet the uterus and like recover and recovery from that for me like body wise I really did not get back to actual normal until about February and I had that surgery in November um, I felt really good, but I still had a lot of recovering to do, a lot of sort of regaining my functionality, you know, that, um, that I had lost by having so much defective um, machinery in my body, if you will. Um, so yeah, then I set my sights on top surgery. At that point, I was like, okay, I'm ready, Dr. Barry, I've got more money saved up. And then they told me they raised the cost of the surgery and even though travel restrictions were taken care of and I was going to be vaccinated by the time I was going to have the surgery, um, I would still have to quarantine for two weeks prior to the surgery in the UK. And that's just not something I could afford. So um, yeah, they almost doubled the price pretty much of the surgery and then added in that and I was like, okay, cool, this is not going to work for me. And I'm kind of glad that I didn't end up doing that because now that I'm recovering from top surgery, here we are in November of 2021, uh, now that I'm recovering from top surgery, which I also got 360 lipo with to sort of deal with a body shape issue I was having, um, yeah, I would not have wanted or even probably been capable of getting from the place where I was staying through the airport, on a plane, and flying home without some significant issues. Because, yeah, the recovery from this has been 
just absolutely painful, ridiculously uncomfortable, um, and 100% worth it. I'm gonna be honest, my top surgery stuff, I feel a little bit sore. I feel like I worked out. That's about the extent of the top surgery pain, but the liposuction recovery pain, now that's like a whole other beast. Not being able to use my core or my back for like anything uh, for the first two and a half weeks of recovery was awful. Um, and then the waking up of the nerves in those, those regions, I've always been hypersensitive to any type of physical sensation, especially in the region of the sort of the abdomen, the sides and the back. Um, and not in like a good way, but in a like being touched there is somewhat painful to me sort of way. It got worse after my hysterectomy, so now my nerve responses as are sort of waking up, reconnecting, and my lymphatic system is repairing itself. Um, it's severely uncomfortable. I've got like, you know, the electric shock things, that's easy for me to deal with because I've had that electric shock feeling on a regular basis probably for four years now. But the weird numbness and tingling and pain and the um, sort of balance that I've had to find between compression and non-compression, um, that's been really the hardest part for me. Uh, additionally, I ended up having two drains put in for my liposuction but not my top surgery. So I've still got one drain in and yeah, I just want it out, man. Like. It's right above and just to the rear, like posterior to my right hip. And it could not be in a more inconvenient place. I can't lay on my back without it being pressed. I can't lay on my side without it being pressed or pulled. Um, and obviously I'm still not, a, not at a stage in my recovery where I can sleep on my stomach. Um, anytime I sit, anytime I wear pants or really anything with a waistband, it sort of pulls or pushes on it, severely uncomfortable. Um, and because of the location, as well as the stiffness in my body as I'm recovering, it's really hard to clean. So, like, there are some significant negatives to this that I'm glad I'm dealing with here at home and not while I'm trying to travel to get home. Um, and yeah, I actually, I'm feeling really good these past, like, two days. I've seemed to have found a balance in what medications I need to take in order to be able to sleep. Um, so initially when I had my surgery, they prescribed me, <clears throat> I'm really like voicey today, uh, right? So initially when I had my surgery, they prescribed me hydrocodone, right? I was prescribed hydrocodone and what was really useful about the hydrocodone is I could take a full one if I wanted to be knocked out for the whole day, which was awesome because I really needed a lot of sleep as I was recovering. Um, I tend to have really bad reaction to anesthetic as well as lidocaine, both were used in my procedure. Um, so the fact that I was able to take a medication so that I wouldn't have to deal with things like the hives and the nausea plus the pain, um, fantastic. But then they were like, we can't prescribe you any more of these, so when I did eventually, I didn't run out because I hoard medication, but when I got to the point where I wasn't comfortable using any more without having backup medication, um, and they wouldn't prescribe me anymore, they went ahead and switched me over to Phenergan, which is a really cool medication that helps with nausea, it's a histamine blocker, and additionally, it, no it knocks you the heck out, dude. And that stuff is great because the problem that I tend to have after surgeries, especially if they're a longer one, like this was a seven hour surgery, it's the longest surgery I've ever had, um, I end up getting into an insomnia cycle which my insomnia started when I was um, in middle school or high school and I'm usually able to avoid getting into that insomnia cycle where I'm up for three-ish days at a time and then I sleep for, you know, 20 hours or so. Um, I'm able to get out of or prevent myself from being in that type of a cycle if I'm able to medicate myself to sleep. I am currently having a disagreement with one of my doctors, my primary care physician, so I'm not able to go and say, hey, this is a thing that I need, um, specifically because, well, I'll tell you about it in a different video. But, um, so because of that, having a doctor who is comfortable prescribing Phenergan to help me sleep, to help with the nausea that I still kind of get from, you know, the anesthetic and stuff like that, has been fantastic. 
Um, and because you can cut Phrenergan into halves and quarters, I'm able to take a smaller dose than what I was doing with the hydrocodone, because even half of hydrocodone can knock me out for about eight hours. So I'm able to take a smaller dose, sleep for six to eight hours maximum, be awake for the things I need to be awake for, be functional, and um, not have to worry about, oh, I haven't slept for two or three days. So, you know, that's that's been beneficial. We are now at the, um, the three-week mark, actually just past the three-week post-op mark, and yeah, I kind of want to show off my results a little bit. I went ahead and did just a short video for you on Thursday, which is today. Um, today is Saturday, which means by the time you're watching this, I'll be halfway to the four-week mark. Uh, well, not halfway. I'll be, I'll be four days away from the four-week mark uh, top surgery recovery, which is going to be exciting. I am doing a little bit of a faux pas at the moment. I'm not wearing a button-up shirt, and people are probably going to be like, oh my god, he's not doing it. He's not doing the little, you know, like, T-Rex arms. I am doing the T-Rex arms. I just happen to be really bendy, so, like, I'm able to take things off without raising my arms. Um, which I'm aware is, like, not a thing a lot of people can do, apparently. So, like, I'm even able to wash my own hair <laughs> without, you know, raising my arms and messing this up. So yeah, this is kind of where we're at. This is what we're looking at. Um, my compression garment is in the washing machine, so I am not wearing any compression at the moment. I haven't been for about two hours. And, uh, yeah, I think we're looking pretty good. I'm still pretty tight. Uh, still having a lot of stiffness, so I can't really stand all the way up without feeling like I'm pulling on these incisions here, uh, as well as some of the stuff going on inside. Um, but, like, overall, I'd say I'm really pleased with how this kind of turned out. we still got some tape on. I'm sort of just letting it come off as it falls off, because uh, I noticed that the stuff that fell off was ready to come off, and the stuff that hasn't yet is still, is still working on healing. This nip gave us a stare... A, a scare. Um, we weren't too sure 100% that it was gonna like really survive, um, so it's still a little bit camouflage colored at the moment, uh, and they're not quite evenly shaped. I'm okay with this. I am a little bit frustrated because I did tell the doctor, like initially I didn't want him to resize my nipples, I didn't want him to resize or reshape them because uh, male nipples come in a range of shapes and sizes and I'm comfortable with mine the way they were. Unfortunately, he felt that it would be a little bit awkward to have a nipple take up that much of my chest, so he took it upon himself to adjust it aesthetically. He is a cosmetic surgeon after all, so he does primarily work on making things look pretty. I don't hate it, I'm not upset. To be 100% frank with you guys, I went into this whole situation without having done hardly any research. And I did not ask him questions on what he was going to do. I literally just said, I need my chest flat, I don't care how you do it, and I don't care about scars. I need you to resolve some of this stuff in terms of my shape down here. Don't care how you do it, I don't care about scars. He cared about the scars, which is good. I think I have a good surgeon in, in terms of that. But he didn't quite understand that, like, for me it wasn't about the aesthetic, it was about my comfort in my body, and I think that just this comes from a person who's not used to working with trans people. Um, he's not primarily a trans doctor, he works mostly on um, cis women who want things like breast enlargement um, and you know liposuction, and men who want ma like uh, male mastectomies, and that's you know. That's who was available to me within my price range. Um, he explicitly asked me not to mention his name on my channel or talk about him, like, his name or his, like, practice by name, so I'm not gonna be sharing any of that information with you guys. His loss, he doesn't seem to want to work with trans men, that's, that's on him. I am just happy that I've got what I came for. <laughs> which was to have the body that I'm supposed to have. And that, I don't know if you saw in the video I uploaded, and there's a few other clips that I'll probably share over time. Um, I mean, the one of the first things I said when I woke up was, like, it's flat. Like, I look there, and it's flat, and that is good. And that's really how I feel. When he took off my 
dressings on the day after post-op like appointments, I got to see myself in the mirror for the very first time and that was it, it was perfect. So this is perfect to me. I would like to regain my full range of motion, I would like to get to a point where I'm not having the you know, nerves waking up tingling feelings, and also like I'm willing to endure that for as long as I need to because I was able to get this taken care of. And I think that's where the line is for a lot of trans people. Like, you know, the question of like, what surgeries are you going to do and why? And the question for us really is, one, do I feel like I need this in order to want to be alive? And two, are the risks and compli potential complications worth the reward? For me, for top surgery, for lipo, absolutely. For bottom surgery, no. Um, I, I don't feel like going through that entire recovery process and dealing with that surgery and that pain and all of those things. Will I change my mind in the future? Potentially. Um, but I was already on the fence about bottom surgery because I know how much it entails. I know that it is literal years of surgery for a question, like, you gotta have a really good surgeon, otherwise you're, you're going to have things like fistulas, infections, UTIs, and all kinds of other complications that, like, can happen even if you have the best surgeon, right? These are not things that I'm really comfortable dealing with. My uh, personal bed life is great the way that it is. Um, I still deal with dysphoria, but I have wonderful partners who are comfortable helping me through that and still engaging with me uh, in the ways that make me happy. So for me, bottom surgery at the moment is not on the docket. I don't want to have any more surgeries if I can avoid them. Um, because like body modding is great. I plan on getting some more piercings and you know, um, definitely some more tattoos. Uh, but those, I mean, the risk is minimal, the stress is minimal, and the results are equal to the amount of stress that goes to, like, gets put into them. So, like, for a larger tattoo, there's more stress. For a more complicated piercing, there is more stress. Um, but for the most part, like, all of that compared to this is, is nothing. And that's, I guess, kind of the final thing I wanted to talk about is, like, I did get a lot of fans sort of emailing me, asking me, you know, like, when did you first get into body mod? And it's like, being trans is not about body modification, it is about making my flesh vessel that I was forced to be in since birth is congruent with my perception inside of my brain. Oh, right, and I wanted to talk about how weird it was, because I fully anticipated to wake up from surgery, look down, and be 100% confused, because that has been, like, my entire experience as, you know, things have grown over the years. And the answer is no, that did not even remotely happen. Um, you know, even things like when you open a door in a cramped space, you need to lean back to make sure that you don't hit that, you know, the things with that door. And so I anticipated I'd be doing movements like that where I'd have to, you know, even though I don't have anything, and nope, not even a second thought. Like, I don't reach out to grab them, touch them, move them, adjust them. I don't have any type of, like, phantom titty or anything like that, which is crazy because, like, I do have phantom, you know, lower things. And I think that's just kind of a testament to the way that trans, like being trans has presented itself to me or in me and the way that it presents itself in a lot of people where for us, like the, the mentality, like the thought processes, the things that we know about ourselves don't match up with the things that we are experiencing and seeing. And so like being trans, and pursuing a medical transition or a social transition or, you know, really anything like that. That's why it's such a personal thing and why it's, it's not body mod. It is fixing what is wrong. <laughs> it's like, for example, if you had a body type that was prone to storing a lot of 
weight around the waist area and you weren't comfortable with that. In your mind, you see a skinny person and you look in the mirror or you see maybe instead of a skinny person, you see somebody with this down here instead of up here. Um, and you look in the mirror and it doesn't match up, you're gonna have dysphoria. If you work out and do waist training and things to sort of like shift stuff to where you want it to be, shift your mass in the directions that you want it to be, that's not body mod. Like, that is just you, like, fixing what you feel like needs fixed. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess, kind of everything. I don't really have anything else to talk about in terms of my recovery, uh, things I wish I knew about the recovery, uh, well, about top surgery and liposuction in general. Uh, I think I'm gonna make a video about that, so stay tuned for that, because, yeah, there's a lot that I wish I knew. There are a lot of questions I wish I had asked that I'm scared to ask now. Um, so yeah, uh, if you liked what you saw today, and you want to see more, hit that button down below. Subscribe, become a member of the Jackalope Tribe, and earn your antlers, and don't forget to follow me on all these social media platforms. Uh, I write books. My poetry book just came out. It is titled She's Not Here by JB Lettercast. I'll put a link to it in the description below. Um, I will also be releasing a short story and a short story in an anthology uh, in December. And I also have a Patreon where I post a new short story every month. I'm going to be shifting to every other month for my short stories on Patreon just because the demand has been a little bit high for me and it's a little bit hard to meet that demand. Um, but I'm happy to share my stories with you nonetheless. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Happy two-year anniversary and three-week post-op top surgery day to me. Uh, if you feel like spoiling me, I will also link my Amazon wish list in the description because yeah, I want you to spoil me. Um, and then I'll do an unboxing, like opening up all the presents on camera thing like I used to. Alright, that's it. Peace out. Oh, I like this angle better. I'm gonna stand closer to the camera. Hello. Hi. Oh, no.